Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sylvan Klepsch, and I've just received an absolutely magnificent present, just so everyone knows. And uh, so I'm going to talk about Pony, but hopefully I'm going to talk about Pony uh, in a way where you guys are driving the discussion much more than I am, because if not, I'm going to be punished severely. So the first Pony talk in public that I did was 714 days ago in Prague at Curion. Oh, sorry. I'll talk into the mic. That'll probably be better. Uh, and since then, we've both made a lot of progress and been pleasantly surprised about how much we actually had right in the first place. So let's start with what is Pony. So uh, first of all, has anyone heard of Pony? Wow. OK. That's unusual and very gratifying. Thank you. Um, so it's an actor model, capability secure, general purpose, native language. Uh, it's also an object-oriented language under the hood, although a lot of people treat it as a functional language because it has a lot of functional concepts. But I'm going to gloss over that a little bit. So actor main new create env env, right? That's our version of public static void main string, string array args from Java. And all that means is that we have some actor called main, which is our asynchronous type. An actor is an asynchronous type, or as a class is a synchronous type. And it's got a constructor on it, a named constructor, create. And there's syntactic sugar that says, when you construct an object and you don't provide a name for the constructor, well, you meant create. And it's going to pick up an environment. And here, it's going to look in the environment for the actor that represents standard out. And it's going to send it a print message. And that print message, in this case, is co composed of an immutable string. And I'll touch on that a little bit more as we go. Isolation and immutability are first class concepts in Pony. That's main. That's our Pony. So our goals with Pony are these. And the first one influences all of the others, which is static data race freedom, but with mutability. It's pretty straightforward to have static uh, data race freedom in, in a language that has only immutable types. But we wanted to make sure that we retained mutability both locally inside an actor and also being able to pass mutable data structures safely with uh, no runtime overhead uh, between actors. So that's what a lot of this work relies on. But we also want to leverage that type system for other properties, like no stop the world garbage collection. And I really mean no stop the world, where every actor can independently collect its heap without coordination. It's formally specified. It's not formally verified, but uh, it is formally specified. It comes from building the type system and the operational semantics first, rather than building the language first. So we wanted to make sure single node performance is competitive with C and C++, and uh, it is, which is very exciting. Uh, we take advantage of very aggressive register coloring. We don't necessarily follow the C ABI inside Pony World Code, and it means that we can actually do a bit, little bit better than C on a lot of numeric algorithms. Eventually, distributed computing, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Some good domains for Pony. Here they are. OK, this is not a great slide, because what does this mean? It means general purpose computing. But actually, there's something in this that a little bit shows you the weaknesses of Pony. This isn't saying it's good for scripting languages, because it's not. It's an ahead of time compiled statically typed language. So far, people really aren't using it on the client side. Like the video games work is all server back end stuff. And a lot of this stuff is you know, much more back end, non user facing code. Maybe it'll grow into that space, but that hasn't happened yet. There's a lot in Pony. Uh, I'm not going to talk about most of it today, right? So today I'm going to be talking about a little about data race freedom, a little about native code optimization, work stealing, message queues, GC. I'm not really going to be talking about the type system past reference capabilities. So not much on nothing on generics or intersection types, nominal and structural typing, pattern matching, distributed semantics, capability security, and capability security is actually in some ways at the heart of Pony. I'm going to leave it out today. But if there's something in there that you're interested in that I'm not touching on. Just speak up, and I'll change the talk, and we'll cover that. I'm perfectly happy to dive into any of those subjects instead of what I've got. All right, so data race freedom. If I can write to it, nobody else can read from it, which means if I can read from it, nobody else can write to it. That's the core idea behind Pony's type system, but it's also the core idea behind Pony's runtime, because the runtime is co-designed with the type system. And the idea is to leverage the guarantees that the type system makes to have work that would otherwise be expensive at runtime, dynamic work, be elided entirely, stuff that we just never had to check. 
So for example, the entire pony runtime is lock free. That's pretty fun. All right, so I'm at five minutes. That means you all have to jump in and ask questions now. There's a lot of existing uh, data race freedom work um, uh, that has been extremely influential on Pony. Uh, the one at the top is uh, maybe extra special influential, but they all have had a huge impact on Pony. So Pony's reference capabilities, unlike, uh, well, first of all, let me talk a little about reference capabilities and what they mean. They're a type qualifier, right? They're an annotation on a type that tells you a little bit more about the type as it's viewed through that specific alias that you're dealing with. So an object capability, is anyone familiar with object capability security? Anyone? Hey, that's pretty good. So object capabilities, you have data and the methods express the things you can do on that data. A reference capability says, the methods that I can use through this alias are further constrained, right? So. Pony's reference capabilities, unlike some of the other uh, some other work, are based on deny reasoning rather than allow reasoning. It's based on what other aliases cannot possibly exist because this one exists, rather than saying there's a set of permissions that we're allowing the programmer to have on the object at this point. And that means that we uh, develop the capabilities from those basic deny properties rather than coming up with a set of operations that we wanted to encompass. And this is the matrix that we ended up with. All right, so we have the first column here, which is when we've denied global read and write aliases, what does that mean? And that means that global execution is all actors in the system. Local execution is the current actor that is dealing with the alias at this time. So if we've denied all global read and write aliases, then we go back to that initial uh, proposition, right? If no one else can read from it, then I can write, write to it. And that's what these are. These aliases are mutable. So everything in that first column is mutable. But they're different kinds of mutable. The one at the bottom doesn't deny any local aliases. So there may be any other local alias that might read from or write to this, and we don't know about it, its, its existence. We can't track it, there's nothing we can do. So these are, we call ref, they're references. You can mutate the object, you can read from the object, but you have a strong guarantee that no other actor will have an alias to that object through which it can read from or write to that object. So it's concurrency safe. But then we have a stronger guarantee here with transition. That says that there are no local write aliases. So it is write unique, but it is not read unique. Initially, we didn't think there was any use for this. Uh, then we discovered some uses for it, and actually it appears in a few places in the standard library now as, a, as an interesting pattern. But by far the more common use is the top one there, isolated. There are no read or write aliases at that point. Yeah. And if, uh, if I can correctly understand, why do you need ref if you can do anything with it? Ah, you, sorry. So ref is, you can. You can read from it and you can write to it. What you can't do is share that object with another actor. So it's an object for which there is no possibility for concurrency. Uh, so I can't send that uh, object to another actor, uh, nor could I have received that object from another actor in that form. Although, interestingly, that's where isolated comes in. Because when you have read uh, excuse me, when you have local alias denies that are the same as global alias denies, then you have the same properties in both global and local execution. And that means that this, these on the diagonal here are what is called sendable. Those are the reference capabilities that it is possible to send to another actor. All right, so that leads into this second column here. Those are aliases for which we have denied global write, but not global read. So they're immutable. We can read these, but we can't write to them because we can't be certain that no other actor isn't also reading from them. And if we mutated them, we would have inconsistent data. But there's two different kinds of, mutab of immutability here. We have immutability where we haven't made any guarantees locally. So it's locally immutable. It's only immutable through that reference. The, the, act, the current actor might also hold a mutable reference to that object, but it might not. And the other one is where we've actually made the global guarantee. That's an actual, deep, deeply immutable object uh, 
it is, it is not now, nor could it ever be in the future, mutable. And that's safe to share with lots of actors. But there's a big difference here between Val, which is safe to share with lots of actors, and ISO, which is really only safe to share one actor at a time. One actor can have it, you can pass it to another actor, but that's all, right? Because if you had more than one that could uh, read from a write to it, you'd have a problem. And the last one is tag, opaque. Means you can't read from it or write to it. Does anyone have any idea what that could be useful for? Why would you want an opaque alias? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a classic example of that in the standard library is timers, where in order to set up uh, hierarchical timing wheels, you use opaque aliases as to the timing information as your cancel token for that timing information. And that gives you really fast uh, cancel behavior, because uh, what do you do with timers? Has anyone written high performance network applications? Anyone? All right, so the people who have, what do you do with a timer? Check it. Who checks timers? They fire. You check timers? All I ever do is cancel timers. It's the only thing I ever do with them. You set up zillions of timers and then you cancel them, right? Because you're doing, uh, let's say you're doing IP packet reassembly because you're doing network monitoring or something like that. And what you're mostly looking for is detecting timeout windows and canceling stuff. So that's the super high performance use case that you want is to just get rid of the thing. The other thing interesting that you can, interestingly that you can do with tag that is uh, uh, maybe not immediately obvious, is you can use it to send asynchronous messages. Because an asynchronous message neither reads from nor writes to the target. And that means actors themselves are, in, are incorporated into the reference capability type system, which is pretty fun. It means that an actor might fulfill this, a structural interface in the same way uh, an object would. An asynchronous a class might fulfill a structural interface in the same way as a synchronous class. And you'd have a reference capability that guaranteed that that would stay safe. That's pretty fun. OK. This is about reference capability compatibility. Does anyone read the morning paper? Anyone ever heard of that? OK. I'm a huge fan of Adrian Collier and the morning paper. And he was uh, very kind and covered a couple of pony papers a while ago. And he drew, hand drew this capability graph and I love it, and I asked him if I could reuse it, and he said yes, for which I'm still thankful. And what this expresses is the programmer's view, as opposed to the type system's view, of what it means for an alias to exist. What other aliases could possibly exist? So if I have something over here, what could possibly exist? And my favorite one part of this whole thing is this part here, because he summed up so nicely why we have local immutability. When you have a locally immutable reference, either un under the hood it's mutable but by the current actor, or under the hood it's immutable and might be shared by many actors. You don't know which, you don't care, but it couldn't possibly be both. And it turns out that's mostly what programmers do in ponies. They write box methods on, on objects that they just need to read from, because it's all you ever really need to do for, for most code to the point where it's a default. All right, so that's a really quick survey through. In fact, let me back up. That's a really quick survey through reference capabilities. This gets much more complicated in the presence of, sorry, yeah. Which kinds of reference types can be coerced into others? What oh, is, great. What is the path that you can go, the transitions you can follow? Fantastic question. So the, one of the nice things about the matrix that uh, means that I still think of this in terms of matrix, even though it's not necessarily the way most pony programmers think of it, is that it expresses that directly in the matrix, which is a capability can decay down and it can decay to the right. It cannot go up and it cannot go to the left. Now, I'm a little bit lying because it's possible to, to create an isolated scope called a recover expression. And in that recover expression, you only have access to things in the lexical scope from outside that little recover scope that are sendable. And that means that inside a recover expression, the result of that expression can move up. You can recover capabilities. And this turns out to be really powerful and really useful because instead of having a situation where you can only do isolated things with isolated objects, you can actually have a recover expression do very complex initialization of isolated or immutable things 
you turn it through the recover, recover capabilities, and now you're back to an isolated or an immutable object. So you can, for example, set up cyclic immutable structures really easily and trivially, just by, as if you were writing normal immutable code inside a recover expression. Does that answer your question? Cool, awesome. So um, there's a lot more that goes into this in terms of things like viewpoint adaptation. What does it mean to read a field out of an object with a particular reference capability? I'm not really gonna cover that unless people are particularly interested. It gets even more complex in terms of alias tracking where you need to under, have inherent in the type system the idea of an ephemeral type. Does anyone know what I mean by an ephemeral type? Like what's the type? Yeah, go on, Paul. Uh, well, it's a type with, there's no, oh, sorry. It's a reference that is, only exists as a temporary and there's no stable alias nowhere so there's no there's no way to name that that, that reference exactly it's, so it's, it's like the return value for example uh. exactly so let's say you've you've just uh, created uh, uh, an object and you, re you return it from a constructor there is no named alias to that thing and that turns out to be really powerful because that's the process by which you can pass isolated things around you can consume aliases so that there are none left and so that when you create one you statically know, with no, no runtime overhead, that that's the only one. All right. So now let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about uh, native code op optimization. So uh, has anyone worked with native GC languages before? All right. What native GC languages have you worked with? Yeah. What native GC languages have you worked with? Sorry? D. Okay. That's an excellent example. So, um, uh, D provides both manual memory management and GC on top of native uh, compilation. So it wasn't that long ago that that was considered really weird, combining ahead of time native compilation with GC. Nowadays, fortunately, that's not considered quite so weird. So uh, it's a GC language, but not interpreted or jitted. It's an LLVM backend. We're going to be using the LLVM linker soon. And we really try to push the boundaries as much as we can with ahead of time optimization. So we compile the whole thing as a single LLVM module, which allows whole program optimization, which is pretty nice. Now, uh, most of the advantage of that comes in some of these other things, because it, sure, it allows a lot of cross-function uh, optimization, a lot of inlining, all this stuff, but it's the other stuff that really helps on that. For example, reification. The whole language is fully reified when you, when you compile stuff. Does anyone see why that might be problematic, though? Anyone? Question. It wasn't yeah, like excellent. your question. There was asynchrony between the two processes. Do, do you ever get programs that are too big to compile with LLVM because of the whole program thing, or, or what's the story there? The story there is not yet, and oh boy, I love the Pony community. So uh, yeah, I'm con constantly worried that we're going to run into a situation where there's a program that just exceeds useful available memory and starts swapping like crazy. The biggest code base I know of is a, is a fintech application out of a company in New York. Um, and it's pretty serious. They're up to a couple hundred thousand lines of pony, and they still have no problem compiling. But only because there's been constant work in the pony community to reduce memory usage, and now there's a nice effort by Benoit Ve to actually add separate compilation to this strategy. I don't really know where he's going with that, and I'm really curious to see what he's doing, but it looks like he's mostly gonna be focusing on getting ASTs as far along as possible before you do the code generation and saving on all that memory. Um, but it is a persistent problem in the back of my head about this, this compilation strategy is that it, it's intensive, it's resource intensive. On the other hand, asking for an eight gigabyte compile machine these days, eh, it's sort of okay. And we've been able to uh, compile very useful programs on Raspberry Pis, where the compiler is actually running on the Pi as well as the executable on the Pi. And you know, we've been able to run programs that are 30, 40, 50,000 lines of code on a Pi, and no, no real problem at all. So maybe it's okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so back to the bit about reification. Does anyone see a problem with with reifying all your types? Has anyone worked it with Java, for example? Anyone? Yeah, maybe a little bit. So Java doesn't do this. Java uh, knows full well that code reuse is incredibly important, right? 
.NET does as well. Yeah. Uh, well, if you reify everything, you're going to have like 50 copies of your list class. Yeah. So that increases your code size. Yeah. Um, also, it, you can't reify types of infinite size which doesn't really matter in practice, I think. So I think maybe it does, and I think it's actually a shortcoming in Pony. Um, and that's really important. So you can pretty trivially write a type that generates new types, uh, uh, in a way that if you were able to generate those new types dynamically, you would have no trouble with. And so uh, .NET has no trouble with it, or Java has no problem, uh, trouble with it. But Pony can't compile it. And right now all it can do is detect that you're in an infinite loop and, and bail out of the compiler. Um, that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, reification here means basically instantiation, right? Whereas yeah. you could be not instantiating and keeping a single method and passing type parameters as actual parameters mm -hmm. as another approach, right? So it's not specifically that reification is a problem, it's just that the approach you're taking is a problem, right? You're absolutely right, and that's a really good point. If, if we took the dynamic approach to that, then we could do this. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think under the hood in Pony, because of type descriptors are so important to, to the way the runtime works, we would have difficulty in synthesizing a type descriptor that was distinct from the other from a type descriptor for a class with different dynamic type parameters, if that makes any sense. But there's probably a way we could do it. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. All right, so one of the things that we do a little bit to try and recover this is leverage LLVM. So LLVM is a really nice merge functions pass that does a better job than you might expect in detecting identical functions and uh, eliminating them. Uh, and that turns out to be really helpful. So uh, there's also no function level ABI, which means we can do register coloring and really aggressive uh, heap to stack allocation optimization. So uh, instead of saying, okay, there are certain calling convention on pony functions, nah, we're just gonna munge it all up and there's really no useful way to call into pony from any other programming language. And as a result, it means that we also generate on demand, when you use pony as a library for uh, a C or C++ program, we generate on demand headers and separate entry points that follow the C ABI so that we can get around this. All right, uh, right, so there's actually a note here on separate compilation, which is nice. Also probably should include that uh, I lie a little bit when I say that Pony isn't JIT compiled. The compiler now actually JIT compiles test cases in Pony when it tests the compiler, and there's a chance that that might spread a little bit through the, through the language. So we talked a little bit about reachability and reification here, and uh, the only thing I'm gonna mention off here is that binary sizes seem to be okay. An HTTP server and 312 kilobytes on a 64-bit mach uh, 64 machine, yeah, it's okay. So uh, one of the things that we do in runtime to, as part of our optimization is something called selector coloring. Has anyone heard of selector coloring? <laughs> Jan invented selector coloring. Uh, it, so this is a uh, lovely, lovely trick that you can do, which is you can try and figure out, in the, much the same way that you do register coloring, you can try and figure out a, a nice contained sets of selectors that exist on types and so that every method of a certain name, or possibly even an entire signature, depending on how you implement it, has the same vtable index. And that's nice, right? You don't have to do something like what Go does where you generate alternate vtables or anything like that. But what could that be amazing for? Is that hand going up? Yeah. Yeah. If there's no ABI, how do you debug the binary? When it doesn't ah, that's do what you want. An excellent question. That's a super good question. So the way that we deal with that is quite fun. So we generate uh, a full set of dwarf information, and we pre right now we pretend to be C++ when we generate dwarf information. Hopefully we're going to get beyond that, but in order to do that, we're going to have to write a, a language plugin to LLDB and possibly for GDB. But by pretending to be C++ and generating dwarf information, it turns out both LLDB and GDB can cope with the fact that we are not following a particular ABI, and they can cope with it really well. So we can debug Pony at, with GDB and LLDB, which is pretty neat. Now what we can't do yet is parse Pony expressions in the debugger. So what you end up with is this, this funny skill set as a Pony programmer, where you're debugging your program and you break, and then you start expressing 
pony as C expressions the debugger can parse and execute over your pony data. So that's not very good. That's not a very good story. But at least we can get to the point where we're doing binary debugging, and that's a really good point. And actually, that raises the larger question of over tooling in general and profilers, for example. Uh, it turns out violating the C ABI also doesn't matter to profilers, because as long as you've got these, you know, ELF-style entry points depending on your platform, it's okay. So you can run instruments over it, you can run VTune over it, and you'll get all the same data you'd get out of a C or C++ program, which is a really big deal, right, to have that kind of tooling support. It's not really first class. I don't want to oversell it, right, because it doesn't understand that it's debugging or profiling Pony. It just sees something with, with a bunch of function calls that look like they're on a C stack, and so it gives you some information that's pretty useful. Ah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, do you want to ask it in? I don't know if everybody heard. Okay, so there's no ABI, but does it at least respect the frame pointer register? Yeah, it does. In fact, uh, it, it, it keeps the exact same stack, uh, approach to stacks as C does. And that turns out to have other benefits as well, which is that we can have incredibly cheap CFFI, right? To call C, you just call the function. There's no marshalling, there's nothing. Now, if you want long-lived data inside of uh, a C function, you might have to deal with pinning because of, your GC, of the GC, but that's really it. All right, uh, that said, we have been looking at moving to perfect hashing for method dispatch, and that's to deal with REPLs, basically, and loadable code, maybe. So I'm not sure if we are gonna go down this route, and if we do, I'm not sure if it's gonna be for all possible compilations of Pony, but it's a way that, that is a bit slower than selector coloring, but it allows you to load code, right? It allows you to expand the set of, of methods, because if you have structural types that you're doing selector coloring over, you have uh, an open world type system. So as soon as you add more types, your selector coloring might be out of date. All right, I'm gonna switch tracks again and go to work stealing. So actors are essentially a lightweight threading mechanism, right? Okay, sure, they're a lot more complicated and as an actor model person, it kind of makes me feel people, it makes me crazy when people say that, but it's true. And so under the hood, what we do is we have scheduler threads that are bound to cores and a scheduler thread has a queue of actors and an actor has a queue of messages. So while a scheduler thread is executing an actor behavior, that's it. That's all that, that stack is used for, is executing that behavior, right? Um, this is quite different from other approaches where you have uh, cooperative scheduling of actor behaviors and things like that. So right now, we don't do any cooperative scheduling. Anyone think that's a problem? Anyone? No one thinks not uh, having only uh, uh, cooperative scheduling and no preemptive scheduling? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So because of the work stealing, it means that other threat, scheduler threads pick up those actors and, and run them. So you'd have to have long running behaviors across your scheduler threads in order to provoke a problem. And if we run into that, we're, uh, we're gonna add a uh, system to the runtime of spawning up new scheduler threads, but that's a little bit more complex. So scheduling actors on scheduler threads is a bit tricky. Um, has anyone ever dealt with Erlang? All right, good. So are you familiar with how Erlang schedules actors across cores? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's a little problematic. It's, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> okay, someone has definitely dealt with it because they're laughing. So Pony takes an approach that is trying to emphasize cache over everything. So if you send a message to an actor that is currently has an empty queue, we'll schedule that actor on the current scheduler thread because the message itself is more likely to be in cache than the actor's working set, right? But if you send a message to an actor that's already scheduled on some scheduler queue, we leave it in place because it's more likely that its working set is in cache and would oh, it, the size of that working set is likely to be bigger than the message. Not necessarily, though. All right, so let's look at scheduler queues. Here's the claim. Zero atomic operations to in queue, a CAS loop to DQ. Single, single producer multi-consumer queue to allow for work stealing. Anyone believe me? No, excellent, I love that. So uh, uh, actually, given that, let's just go to the code. Here we go. So this is push single right here. Uh, is that readable? No. 
let's make it bigger and let's change the font a little bit here. Ah. Here we go. Who sees a problem with that? Anyone? On push single? We have a load explicit. That's non-atomic on x86. Store explicit. Atomic on x86. Yep, without having to, it's non-atomic. You still get the atomic behavior. All right, it's a trick. Because the problem comes when you're popping. And popping takes a little bit of code. There we go, <laughs> on the scheduler case. So what I'm gonna, instead I'm gonna show you is how we do it on a message queue because it's a little simpler to grok. So let's talk about fast zero copy message passing. So, and I'll, I promise I'll explain the queues as we go. So reference copy capabilities allow us to pass and share pointers without copying, right? Because it makes all these lovely data race freedom guarantees, but that's not good enough. We need crazy fast queues. So here we're gonna have one atomic exchange with no loops to in queue and zero atomic operations to DQ on a multi-producer single consumer queue. All right, anyone believe me? Good, here's in queue. And this one's a little simpler to understand. Now this is taken straight from the runtime. Uh, so, you know, it's got like if def use val grind in there and stuff like that, but try and get past that. So what we're doing is we're storing a null pointer to the next. Now, uh, I have to warn you that I'm a runtime writer and as a result, when we have a queue, obviously we push to the head and we read from the tail, okay? I, it's, I'm sorry, that's just how we write queues. So we're gonna change the next pointer to null, and then we're gonna do an atomic exchange. This is our one and only atomic operation. There's no CAS loop, there's no nothing here. And we're gonna change the queue head for our new pointer. What's the problem? Not only that, we're doing it with a relaxed memory ordering. What's the problem here? Anyone? Sorry? Yeah. What the hell? We didn't change the tail, did we? Right. So this is an inconsistent queue at this point. The next operation is we take that previous pointer, which was the thing that was formerly the head, and we fix up its next pointer down here. And what that means is there's a period of time in which the queue is non-empty and a reader may see an empty queue. And as long as you're willing to accept that, right, that there's certain kinds of linearizability that you can't really express with this, now you can have a crazy fast queue. There's also some stuff in here to detect empty queues atomically and things like that, and that's for scheduling. So that gives you a DQ that looks like this. What's the problem? Anyone? Used to reading this kind of code? So we're reading the tail, that's good. We're finally reading that damn tail. Now we're loading next off the tail the thread fence is actually compiled down to a no-op on x86, that's it for the ARM implementation. We change the tail to the next pointer, we free the previous tail, we return next. There are two problems here. Anyone? No? Okay. So when we return, what we're returning is something that's still on the queue. And that's for memory management. The other interesting one is that we can read next that's null for out of that inconsistent queue. And the only reason that's okay is because messages in Pony are causally ordered. And this enforces that at zero cost in the runtime. And the nice advantage is uh, this kind of enforcement means that you'll come back and read the next message eventually. So it's fine. All right, yeah. Um. One atomic to DQ or NQ, I can't remember which one. Yeah. Um, but that's on Intel, and you like seem to take advantage of the Intel memory model. How Absolutely. like how does that change on ARM or other places, uh, and like what's your cost there? Excellent question. So uh, atomic uh, store explicit here for a uh, relaxed memory order on ARM. Uh, this does mean that you're going to set up. Possibly, I'm not familiar enough with the ARM instruction set to know exactly the cost there, unfortunately. But you are gonna set up a, a uh, uh, load uh, LLSC, and I can never remember the LL, store conditional. Uh, and not only that, 
but you're going to pay a, possibly a little bit more cost here on the store explicit. And on DQ, the most important cost of this whole thing, those costs are pretty minor, that's the one that kind of hits you, is that you need a thread fence on ARM to take care of this. Uh, if anyone wants to volunteer their skills with low-level ARM atomics, I would be eternally grateful. I suspect that there are optimizations that, we could be, that could be made here on ARM. It's a really good point. All right, I'm out of my time for this stuff. Does anyone have more questions on this? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, I guess it obviously does raise a question here for me, you know, like x86 and ARM, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, they are the big players, okay? Yeah. But it does make me wonder how tied you are to these architectures, and if we have some new architectures come along, are you going to be able to make Pony run as well on those machines? That's an excellent question. So right now, there's uh, a guy in the community, uh, Dara Ennis, who's doing a MIPS port. Um, it's gone pretty well for him. Uh, unfortunately, he's keeping it for himself at the moment because he has a startup in, down in uh, London, but hopefully that'll, he'll open source that soon. Uh, but he's using it in, in the code that he's supplying to his customers, so it does work. Um, all of our atomic operations are encapsulated in a single header file that is essentially the file to be ported for the low-level runtime. If we've done it right, which is an open question, porting just that header file to your new platform is sufficient at the atomic operation level to cope with a new platform. There can be some other issues that you might need to cover too uh, that have to do with whatever your C runtime is and stuff like that. But architectural issues should theoretically be confined to one header file that needs alteration. And we're using um, concepts that are pretty well established. So if a new architecture will come along and have drastically different concepts in terms of what atomic operations look like and what memory ordering looks like, we would probably have to re-examine it. But if someone wanted to do a PowerPC port, for example, that would be trivial, right? Because it has pretty close to the same atomic semantics as an ARM. But that's a really good question. And uh, actually, that is related to another problem that we had, was that we originally wrote this as a 64-bit only language, and the theory that, ah, who needs 32-bit computation? <laughs> Lots of people need 32-bit computation, and we had to backtrack really quick. And so we have native types to express things like a pointer with integer which we really thought we weren't going to have to do. Uh, fortunately, we're a little more strict about it than C in terms of what, it, what you have to do. You have to do explicit conversions of bit widths. So the pony code doesn't need porting when you move between 32 and 64 bit. Only the runtime does, which is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. It's not related to the internals of the language. or uh, What plans do you have for, for the language ecosystem or tooling or things to make the developer experience more productive? That's a fabulous question. I think in many ways that's more important than the language itself. Uh, so th the answer is we're trying not to dictate to the community. Is, and that's kind of a cop-out and kind of a good thing. So, so far, we've talked a lot uh, on GitHub issues primarily about package management, for example, and the different approaches to package management. And there is a package manager out there called Stable, which is pretty good. It deals with a lot of stuff. Uh, it does not deal with everything the author wants it to deal with, uh, Joe McLevane, but it deals with everything I want out of a package manager, so I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but I think it spreads beyond that. So we have an RFC process that we shamelessly stole from Rust. They have an excellent RFC process, so we copied it. And that's meant that the community has had a pretty big impact on the language so far. Uh, that's meant things like editor support has gone really well. Um, one of the things we're really looking forward to is um, there's a project to build uh, a back end for type checking and compiling that follows uh, a particular protocol, the name of which I, uh, escapes me, that, uh, sorry? Thank you, that's the one. So it follows the language server protocol, so you can plug into lots of different editors and get all kinds of really neat features out of that. Um, that's in progress right now. Uh, debugger support, as we were talking about earlier, I think is a core part of this, and we're gonna need better debugger support. Um, I'm particularly interested in actor model debugging because it seems to be a little different. What if I want to trace an asynchronous message instead of a synchronous function call? And it would be really cool to move towards debugger support that, can, that treats that as a first class problem. Are there any other kinds of developer ecosystem type issues that you were thinking of? 
I actually, if I may, we are running out of time. So okay, I think great. we have to thank Sylvain and go for a break and then meet here in 10 minutes. Thank you. Great. And if any. <laughs> Thanks. And just a quick note if you do want to talk about garbage collection, I will happily waste all your time. Thanks.